You've written about the human population monster. Would you clarify what you mean by this? Well, uh, many years ago I used to refer to this as the uh, population octopus, meaning that it affected uh, uh, eight factors in our lifestyle and our standard of living, meaning food, uh, shirt on our back, roof over our head, uh, fuel to keep us warm, especially in winter, uh, a job to gain our livelihood, uh, schools to develop our talents and medical care when we're ill, and uh, energy for our transport and factories and so on. But as I began to focus closer, I became more and more aware that there were many indirect factors uh, that were affecting our quality of life as well. And uh, it wasn't a centipede, but it became, in my mind, a monster because it impinged on all aspects of quality of life uh, and that it affected different sectors uh, of each society in different ways, depending on their standards of living, their incomes, or their poverty, depending on how you look at it. And so that's how I transpose the octopus to the population monster because of its broad impingement on many aspects of life. You say that there's an intimate relationship between population, food, and energy. <coughs> Would you outline this relationship? If we go back to the beginning of agriculture, some 10 or 12,000 years ago, uh, judging from the evidence that's now available, it's really a very short period of time in, in the context of the history of this planet, Earth. And yet we see how much additional food is required today than, say, in the beginning of uh, our agricultural period. Uh, we can probably assume that, uh, based on projections backward, for whatever they're worth, the best guesses we have, that there were probably 15 million uh, people living at the time of the discovery of agriculture, but they were dispersed in many parts of the world and there was a vast amount of uh, land that could be cleared and open to cultivation as uh, was needed. There were periods of hunger uh, following droughts or when we reached near the carrying capacity with the technological methods then under use, which were very different from those of today, uh, there came a period of drought or of insect or disease epidemics and there was famine. What happened to cure that? More land was opened. And so uh, hunger appeared many times, recorded in history and almost certainly many, many other times that were not recorded. But the situation is very different today. In 1975, when the world population stood at uh, approximately 4 billion, the total production of all kinds of food was 3.8 three billion metric tons. Uh, about one-third of that come from the grain crops. These are the staples. Uh, in densely populated countries, most of that grain is consumed directly as food by human beings. In other places where uh, there's an abundance of grain, much of it is converted into animal products such as meat, milk, eggs, uh, cheese, and so on. So the situation is different in different parts of the world. But nevertheless, as we look ahead, uh, we see that we're coping with an entirely different magnitude of problems uh, than occurred uh, uh, at the, let's say, in about 1830, 1850, at the time of the discovery of the basic uh, uh, knowledge of communicable diseases, the dawn of uh, medicine. Uh, then population stood at about two billion. Or if we compare it even to the time of the discovery of our modern day antibiotics, sulfur drugs, and uh, improved vaccines, which was in 1930, when the population stood at about uh, uh, two billion. Uh, I think I uh, erroneously said uh, two billion at the time of the discovery of medicine. It was really one billion then, and two billion at the time of the discovery of modern antibiotics and improved vaccines. Uh, the, amounts of, uh, the population growth is uh, growing ge geometrically, obviously, and the numbers that we're needing to provide basic food for grows uh, at a frightening rate. 
I mentioned that uh, the production in 1975 was 3.3 billion metric tons. 98% of that came from the land, only 2% from the ocean and inland waters, fishes and crustaceans and so on. Uh, for the foreseeable future, we will have to continue to produce most of the food that's needed from the land. And the magnitude of the problem that confronts us for the next 40 years is fantastic and frightening. Uh, uh, using as a guide as to what we might anticipate with population growth as it was in 1975, uh, the world population will probably double or near double by the year 2015. Uh, that means that to maintain per capita food consumption at the same level as it was in 1975, the 3.3 billion tons of food will have to become 6.6 .6 billion tons of food. Or in other words, we will have to uh, increase world food, uh, food production as much in the next 40 years as uh, was done from the beginning of agriculture 10 or 12,000 years ago up till 1975. That is the magnitude of the problem with which we must cope if we are going to have a stable world, stable, uh, wor orderly world. Uh, there is the second problem of equal importance, and that is the equitable distribution of this food. First we must produce it, and then we must assure that it is equitably distributed, otherwise we will have growing unrest, economic, social, and political chaos. Uh, so, this problem of food, which to me is the first basic necessity for a decent, humane life, we cannot continue to ignore. Unfortunately, in the developing nations of the world, where much of this increased production will have to take place in the next 40 years, agriculture has no prestige. Those who are born and have lived the drudgery of a rural life uh, with the lack of the many benefits employed by the urban peoples, strive for something better, those who are fortunate enough to get an education. And when the opportunity to study at the university level uh, presents itself, they want to become a doctor of medicine, a dentist, a lawyer, or an engineer. Very few want to have anything to do with agriculture or agricultural sciences. This is a sad state of affairs. And it is not only in the third world nations, but the developed nations and exhibit A is the USA in its over-sophisticated approach towards agriculture. Today, there is less prestige in agricultural sciences in the USA than there was 40 or 50 years ago. And why? Because today, essentially, 75% of the US population is urban. Another 20% is, uh, lives in cities of intermediate size, down to villages, but mostly in intermediate size cities and less than 3% is engaged in agriculture. You can sense that they are all convinced that food comes from the supermarkets. And if this uh, sort of attitude prevails, we will never be able to produce this food that's required. And the U.S. population is drifting farther farther away from the complex problems of agricultural production. Uh, most of the non-rural population thinks that any fool is smart enough to be an, uh, a farmer or a rancher, that it doesn't require much talent. And yet this is one of the most complicated of all industries that we have today. And I say industries. It's more than a way of life in the USA at the present time. It's a way of life in many of the developing nations. I am fearful for, of what I see in our school systems in the developing nations. Pick up a... a high school science book. Most of them will contain a paragraph or so on agriculture and animal husbandry, but they may include two chapters on environmental issues, which really are of very secondary importance compared to this basic uh, activity of life that must produce the most basic of all foods. And unless this is changed in our educational systems beginning in high schools and continuing through our liberal arts schools,
the world will automatically drift into more and more chaos. Uh, take a look at the television programs in a country such as USA or the nations of Western Europe. Each night when they're presented or several times during the day, the big emphasis is given to whether the weather will be pleasant for enjoyment of outdoor recreation. How often is a comment, even one comment, made about whether it has any impact on agriculture or not. Think about these problems. What do we do about it? How do we get some prestige for agriculture? How do we draw attention to its importance? We will never reach the essential goal unless these attitudes are corrected first in the developed nations, the affluent nations, and at the same time if we can give agriculture some prestige in the developing nations and if we can train enough scientists not to just be delving into the theory and hypotheses of how to change agriculture but really work on the land with the farmers with the ranchers to help them to increase food production for it is they who do the producing Some have said that technological innovations for increasing the world food supply are much more realistic uh, hope for feeding the world than population control efforts. Would you comment on this? My own feeling is that these are two opposite sides of the same corn, coin. When you talk about food production with improved technology, you still must ask the question, food for how many? And what was adequate with the technologies of 1930 and the population of that time is completely inadequate today. There are those uh, utopians who believe that we should uh, abandon the use of modern technology and go back to the good old pre-chemical fertilizer, pre-chemical uh, pesticide control uh, so that we wouldn't have the negative effects on the environment. My answer to them is, what will we do with the additional two billion people that have come onto the stage of life since 1930? That question answers itself. We must continue to improve our technology if we are to keep pace uh, with this uh, uh, growing demand for food, if we are to have a stable world. Uh, there's no turning back. When we talk about population growth, it is my hope that the growth will slow so that all who are born into this world we can provide with the basic necessities for a decent humane life. By that I mean food in one's stomach, a shirt on one's back, a roof over one's head, a job to gain one's livelihood, and to me, a job that is constructive, productive, is the best medicine God ever gave man. Schools to develop our talents, medical care when we're ill, uh, without these, and of course fuel and energy, which is essential, and the raw non-renewable uh, resources, the raw materials for a fabric. Unless these are available to the masses of the people, uh, then uh, there's no use talking about just food or population. They're two opposite sides of the coin. Um. The potential of the Green Revolution. Some have said it has failed. Others have said we expected too much from it. At the same time, many countries are still counting on high-yielding varieties to solve their problems. Could you comment on this? Yes, indeed. I'd be pleased to comment on this. Uh, I said uh, in 1970, when I was uh, when I met the press right after the Nobel Award, and they asked if uh, this meant that. Uh, the Green Revolution had solved all the world food problems, production problems for the future. I said this was ridiculous. What it did indicate that uh, there had been certain dynamic, dramatic changes in per acre and in total production increases in food production in some of the uh, most serious food deficit nations of the world. This had been achieved with the introduction of high yielding technology, improved high yielding varieties, the proper use of the right kind of fertilizer, uh, improved cultural practices, uh, and so on. Uh, I said all that this could do was to buy time to bring into better balance population growth and our ability to provide the basics to provide a decent standard of living who, 
to all who come on the stage of life. I think the results have been far great better than I ever anticipated. To illustrate, I use the case of Indian wheat production. And there are many other examples, both in wheat and rice and other crops, that could be used uh, were there time. Indian wheat production in 1966 stood at 10 and a half million metric tons. The production this past year, the harvest just finished, was 34.7 million metric tons, more than threefold increase. This would not have been achievable without improved technology. It could not have been done in that country, and the same is true for many other countries, uh, by increasing the area under cultivation of this crop. There's no more land, or very little more land, that can be open to cultivation. So it's a concrete case of a spectacular achievement. In the last two years, India has become, for the first time since its independence, self-sufficient in all basic food grains, and has accumulated a stock of approximately 20 million metric tons, perhaps twice what is needed for a strategic, strategic retur uh, reserve against a bad year. Uh, I could say that the same for Pakistan's wheat uh, production. Uh, the same could be said for rice uh, production in increases in India, in the Philippines, and in a number of other countries. It is not just under irrigation, uh, which is sometimes claimed, that these technological improvements have come about. Uh, Turkey has... In terms of the production problem, some have argued that better distribution, increase in incomes, better storage and shipping, and less end-use waste would solve the problem. What are the prospects for enlarging food supply by means other than increased production? Well, of course, uh, all of these various points that have been interjected into the food issue are important. Uh, I have already mentioned that uh, food distribution, equitable distribution, is of prime importance to solving human problems, social problems, political problems. Uh, this must be done. But before you can distribute sufficient food equitably, to all who need more food, you've got to produce it first. Now, it's rather easy to distribute an abundance of flowery oratory about food and about filling human needs. But to fill empty stomachs requires more than flowery, beautiful, oration. It requires substance, food produced on the land or in the ocean and inland waters. And uh, it's a, certainly that there has been a great deal of loss of food because of inadequate storage facilities, especially in the developing nations of the world, and this is a serious problem. It will call for increased investments in better storage facilities. Uh, there is great wastage of food. And I think the most guilty of that are the affluent nations. How many times do we go into the best restaurants in the largest cities of the world and see a big steak served that's much larger than a person can eat? And the rest of it goes out into the garbage can. There are all kinds of wastages. That too needs to be corrected. But that won't produce the food Cutting these wastes out won't produce the increases that we must have to uh, correct for growing population. That is another part of a complex problem. It starts with production, equitable distribution, and then the reduction in wastage insofar as possible, or losses. You mentioned something that there wasn't that much more arable land in the world. What is the potential for increasing the amount of arable land in the world today, and what will it take to bring some of this land in? There are some places in the world where there are still substantial areas with uh, more or less adequate rainfall that could be brought into production. Uh, it will require, in many cases, vast capital investment. Let's take the case of Sudan. First, the infrastructure of transport. 
is not fair. This would have to be developed. There are other areas in Central Africa where the rainfall is adequate, uh, where there has been uh, relatively slow and little development in agriculture because of certain health problems. Trypanosomiasis, the tessie fly uh, being the vector, uh, which is essentially served as a barrier against the uh, stable agricultural communities. Uh, malaria is another barrier in many of those parts. Uh, little by little, I suppose, with better research, these things will be gradually overcome. But sometimes, uh, with the elitism that's come into the environmentalist movement, they ban a certain product, such as DDT in the USA, and I've warned against what would happen in 1971 when they not only passed the legislative uh, or administrative act to ban its use there, but then there were elitist forces that uh, told the developing nations of the dangers of these compounds without considering benefits against risks. Uh, most of the developing nations were malaria had been a disastrous problem until brought under control with DDT, were frightened, abandoned spraying and dusting with DDT, and we know the consequences. Hundreds of millions of additional cases of malaria today that should not have occurred and would not have occurred if we had continued to use wise policies in those nations. Today they're back killing mosquitoes with chemicals. Chemicals are like any other agricultural chemicals or chemicals for public health programs are like medicine. They have to be used in the right way. If you take the medicine, assuming you have an infection and prop, uh, the doctor has uh, diagnosed it properly, if you take the prescription properly, it will probably alleviate your infection, cure your disease. And if you take it improperly, it will probably kill you. And so it is with certain pesticides. Uh, there's no easy way to control these complex problems. And so we, we have to look at the broad uh, aspects. There are, uh, there's a lot of water that uh, goes into the sea during monsoon season still in India, in Pakistan that needs to be controlled with uh, better uh, irrigation systems. Uh, it's not just the amount of water, though. There are enormous uh, lack of, uh, there's enormous lack of uh, drainage in many irrigation systems, such as the Indus, so that the water itself and the fertilizer that's used produces only uh, a low percentage what it would be capable of producing were there adequate drainage to prevent water logging and accumulation of salts. Uh, the floods that sweep the subcontinent of India and Pakistan and Bangladesh each day is the effect of the destruction of the forest in a large part in the outer ranges of the Him uh, Himalayas or Himalayas. Uh, Nepal has been, which is one of the principal watersheds, has been de deforested. The erosion is tremendous, uh, and there's a tremendous need for reforestation of those watersheds so that dams could be built to generate hydroelectric power that Nepal could sell, uh, sell to the other sub, uh, that is to India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, so that it could use this hydroelectric power to fix uh, nitrogen from the air to produce and export fertilizer. If the forests were regenerated, they could be exporting timber. They could do, there's more opportunity in a country with that type of topography for employment in forests well managed than in agriculture. They could afford to import food. Whether this will ever be done will depend on the, the world's ability to help a country such as Nepal with the capital investments to bring this about. I often dream. I dream about what would happen if the armies of the world spent six weeks each year planting trees on eroded wastelands. We might be surprised how much we could improve the environment. Uh, and I think it would be better use of manpower than the uh, activities that are aimed at destruction, often in the name of protection. But I doubt very much that unless this kind of approach is done, 
that the developing nations ever will in any, any substantive way be able to uh, develop reforestation and afforestation programs that will be any of, of any great magnitude. And yet these renewable resources for the future are of tremendous potential importance. In the case of uh, uh, the USA, you could open considerable additional land to agriculture, but it would be land of uh, secondary and tertiary quality. And in order to do it, you would be deforesting many of the areas that are used now for forest production, largely for recreation, uh, or for a combination of forestry and grazing. And that doesn't see, seem to be the wise thing to do. We need to intensify our agriculture, and not only our agriculture, but our forest uh, technology is still in its primitive stage in the USA. And this is also true, really, in the most advanced uh, forestry nations of Europe, Sweden. Much more technology can be developed to improve the productivity of these. And this will give more flexibility for multiple use, for recreation, for wildlife habitat, for uh, watershed protection, as well as producing forest products. But we don't have the energy or the courage to implement these programs. We talk. We talk minutiae by elitist groups, one interested in wilderness areas for a few privileged citizens, while we neglect the development of, of uh, green belts and parks in the rotting uh, slums of our cities or in the green belts around the edges of the big cities where the people live in big numbers that do not have the resources to travel across a nation from one end to another to enjoy the wilderness. And I say this, enjoying the wilderness. In a, as a young forester, I spent happy parts of happy years in the back country of the Salmon River. And I enjoy the wilderness, but it's a privilege for the elite. Just how, well, I think you've said this, but I'll ask you. Anyway. Just how critical is the world food situation now? And what are the prospects for an adequate world food supply by the year 2000? What steps should we be taking to ensure this? Well, uh, we're in considerably better situation today than we were worldwide in 72 or 3 and 74, uh, when there was. Uh, droughts in a number of nations, poor food crops in the Soviet Union and during the summers and in the Sah uh, Sahil uh, and in parts of the subcontinent during the rice season. And this was complicated further by the shortages of fertilizer during that time, uh, which uh, reduced our ability to uh, increase production in the privileged uh, irrigated areas. Now, today, uh, there have been a number of good harvests. I've mentioned already the reserves that have been accumulated in India uh, as a case in point. Uh, there has been uh, progress in the People's Republic of China, the most densely populated and largest population of the world, through the introduction of improved technology and especially through the growing, rapid uh, growth of the use of chemical fertilizer. Despite the fact that they're the greatest artisans in the world in the use of organic fertilizer, and uh, this brings home the point that uh, those organic uh, gardeners and fattiest of today who think that we uh, need no chemical fertilizer, we can solve the, uh, the world's food production problems uh, uh, simply by going back to these good old days of organic fertilizer, are uh, really badly oriented. The Chinese with their vast investments in chemical fertilizer, tells us this. They saw the need, and they have taken the steps to produce that fertilizer, which is vital to producing the food needs that they must have if they're to have a stable society. OK. Uh, in the, what was the, uh, one what other point? What are some point? of the steps that need to be taken to assure that we can to, uh, to be able to uh, produce the food that's needed by the year 2000, or I use as a base point a little farther ahead, 2015, we must continue to 
uh, spend reasonable amounts of money in agricultural research to improve our technology. But it's not good enough to produce, uh, to improve the technology. This technology has to be transmitted to the farmers, to the ranchers. It's of no value in the government experiment stations or in the laboratories. The problem of transfer of technology is equally important and it must be executed by people who not only know how to do it but have the motivation, the built-in motivation. It has to come from within. Uh, not to be philosophers on agricultural production but to be actual contributors and doers beside those who produce the food and fiber. Then in addition, uh, we must make the capital investments and they will have to be large uh, in fertilizer factories in production of uh, other agricultural chemi chemicals such as uh, herbicides, uh, such as the right kinds of uh, uh, insecticides and fungicides and all of the other uh, products that are essential. Uh, the best and the improvements in the rations for livestock animal production. And we better quit losing ourselves in minutia one of the aspects of this malaise in the world of the last decade, especially in the affluent nations such as the USA, has been that we have been so worried about minutia, about delving into all aspects of uh, the utopian environmental issues, rather than to come to grips with all of these issues in a reasonable, down-to-earth sort of way. Uh, what do I mean? We're worried about the snail darter. Not really, but this is a way to block certain government uh, uh, irrigation and hydroelectric uh, and other types of uh, capital investment to provide electricity and power. Uh, we are concerned about uh, uh, the wild, uh, wild horses and burros uh, without recognizing that there's a certain carrying capacity for all of those animals and in the below uh, average uh, rainfall years, if you have more animals than can be carried, they begin to starve to death or destroy the habitat, barking the trees, competing with other wildlife animals or other wildlife species. We're worried about endangered species of all kinds. So am I, I'd like to keep them around. But the longer we wait to come into balance uh, of this coin I've talked about, population growth and the basic needs for a decent life, the more species will continue to enter the endangered list and eventually be eliminated because of destruction of the habitat by human beings, not in one country but around the world. And so we have to come to have an order of priorities in the things that we are trying to correct. Uh, we have become uh, emotional on the carcinogen movement. Uh, we find it in all kinds of foods, in the air, in the water. I think most of them were there before. We didn't have the devices for detecting them at the very low levels in which they exist. And I'm not excusing abuses uh, that have added greatly to this problem. But we fail to realize that uh, all who are born into this world, sooner or later, must die. That's the nature of life itself. 